so much for coming out tonight to Malvern Books and uh, this this really outstanding reading with uh, Lori Sauerbrunn, Lisa Olstein, Edward Carey, and Deb Olin Unferd. Uh, we're going to start tonight with uh, Lori Sauerbrunn. Lori is the author of two poetry collections, Industry of Brief Distraction and Carnivoria, and a chapbook, Patriot. An NEA Creative Writing Fellowship recipient, her short stories, poems, reviews, and photographs have appeared or are forthcoming in such publications as American Literary Review, Denver Quarterly, The Cincinnati Review, The Southern Review, and Tupelo Quarterly. Lori teaches creative writing at the University of Texas at Austin, right over there, uh, where she also directs the undergraduate creative writing program. She is currently working on a collection of stories. Great. Thank you, Lori. It's so great to see you all here. Um, thank you for coming. And thanks to Malvern for hosting um, this reading again. We're really lucky to have this resource in our community. Many of us remember what it was like in Austin before Malvern. Um, was here and they do provide a just an invaluable um, resource for the writers in our community. Um, so tonight I'm just going to read a little tiny bit of a short story that I wrote. Um, I'm going to start a little bit into the story. Um, the story is called Property and I think that all you need to know is, let's see, that Mar Marland and Mara Moore used to live in eastern Tennessee, and, but then the year prior, um, they moved up to um, upstate New York where Marlon's family lives um, because something happened in Tennessee. And when Marlon, when they lived in Tennessee, Marlon was a cop and uh, Mara was a nurse. I think that's all I have to say. I have to get my little water there. I'll apologize in advance if I spill all over the floor. <laughs> no, I need like a holster. <laughs> holster. Marlon pulled into the gravel parking lot outside the bar around 7.30 p.m. He texted to tell Mara he wouldn't be home for dinner and then turned his phone off before tossing it onto a stack of de-icing equipment repair manuals heaped in the passenger seat. He was supposed to run them down to Middletown after his morning appointment in Suston, but the meeting, to which he was 30 minutes late, turned into a long lunch at an Applebee's bar, and then a short turn at the Yankee Clipper and nearby strip club. It was after 3 p.m. before he began the drive home. Thankfully, his parents had left the office by the time he returned. On Wednesdays, they stayed in town for drinks, and what passed for an upscale fish fry at Copeland's Bistro. His stomach, still sour from last night's whiskey and his two-beer lunch, growled despite the lingering nausea. One hunger led to another. When he thought of bass, he thought not only of fishing, but also of water. White and blue waves led where they always did, right into memories of kissing Mara's older sister, Vanessa at Cherokee Lake down in Tennessee. He felt himself stiffen slightly. The thought of driving up the mountain to see his wife while he had an erection flickered through his mind and right out of it as he softened. He wasn't too sure Mara would be receptive anyway. She had become so uninterested in sex since they moved up to Allenston. But even before they were married, he always had the sense she was on uneasy terms with his penis though he tried to make it into the most benign, neutral, and understanding organ. I think this is the point where I'm like, why am I reading this? <laughs> 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 okay, my friend is going to know about sex, and they're just, I don't have anything. So, bear with me, people. Um, no sex unless she wanted it. No pushing her head towards his crotch when he was drunk and wanted a blowjob. Vanessa, who wanted sex any and all ways, had wrenched his balls once when she woke up to find him on top of her after she passed out. After that, he was a better sexual citizen unless he went into the back room with a stripper. Then manners became more fluid, a different exchange economy 
rising to the surface as an unnamed woman put his hands on her hard breasts or ground her backside into his lap. I think I, I already drink a water, right? <laughs> <laughs> the Ashbrook was busy for a Wednesday night, packed with people trying to cool off the lukewarm beer in the bar's insufficient air conditioning. Standing in the corner underneath the mounted television, Shelley was wiping down the bar. The rag in her hand glowed white in the dim light. The owner, Jackie Delon, always kept the drape shut over the bar's few windows to moderate the temperature, she said. Marlon thought of his own uncovered windows at home and made a mental note to ask Jackie where she got the curtains. He sat on the stool closest to Shelley, who had moved behind the bar and was now restocking glasses. Hey, you, he said, lifting his chin a little. Her eyes flicked towards him, held his for a second, and then went back to the glasses. Even though Shelley was at least 15 years younger, there was something Vanessa about her, something hard set around the mouth. She turned her back to him and began straightening with her bottles. With the towel, she wiped the neck of each, slowly rotating her hand. Marlon stared until he felt her looking at him in the mirror that ran behind the bar. He didn't let his gaze meet hers. Instead, his eyes drifted to the nape of her neck, over her shoulders, down to her bared low back and the top of her hips. Above the waistband of her low-cut jeans scrolled a poorly executed tattoo in blue ink. Tangled vines, blunted thorns, and two roses so blurry they looked as if they were melting. Jackie appeared from the kitchen, blogging his visual inventory of her stepdaughter and pouring him a beer in a shot without asking what he wanted. Placing both glasses on the sticky bar, she held out her hand, palm up and open. With her other hand, she pushed her damp bangs out of her eyes. Put it on my tab, he tried. Jackie shook her head, looking past him to gauge a fight brewing at the dartboard. No more tabs. She was a tall woman, and as she leaned closer to Marlon, her work, her right hip jutted out at an awkward angle. He sighed and pulled his paycheck from his wallet. But I didn't have time to go to the bank. Jackie's mouth was a straight line. I'll cash it, but I'm taking 15%. She was Marlon's father's first wife, and she had no compunction about squeezing a little extra from his son, who in her opinion spent more time talking about work than actually working. Like everyone else in the county, she knew about Delton, that's the town in Tennessee. She knew about Delton and Ralph Blevins. She knew not everyone got second chances. Not everyone got to run home from Tennessee, dragging a pale, pretty southern wife along. Marlon sighed, again and placed a check on the bar. Mara would be angry, but he was always vague about how much his parents paid him and when they paid him, so there was a chance she'd never know. By the end of the night, the summer heat temporarily retracting from the air, Shelley was in the back of his car, her jeans around her knees, and his face wedged between her legs, the de-icing manual shoved into the floorboards. Jackie had seen them leave and said nothing as she closed the register and counted up the night's profits. She would let Marlon run a tab of another sort. The next afternoon, he, wrote, he woke, gasping from a jagged sleep on the couch, his boxer shorts soaked with acrid-smelling sweat. Despite the heat from the sun streaming through the window, he was shivering. Marlon's tactic of drinking six or more beers a night, along with a couple of whiskey backs, was usually enough to shut Ralph Levins out of his dreams. Lately, it had worked less and less. This time, Ralph stood inside the store. He stared at Marlon through the front window, blood running from his mouth, his ears, his eyes. Just before Marlon woke, Ralph's hand reached to the glass Marlon's panicked breaths pulling him closer. Stop breathing, Marlon shouted to himself. Stop breathing, stop breathing, stop breathing. Shaken, he sat up, rubbing his eyes, gripping the nap of the worn area rug with his toes as if trying to hold on. There was a note on the coffee table under the remote. Mara had taken the dogs for a hike in Kingston. He remembered the salty tang of Shelley's crotch and stumbled into the bedroom to make sure he hadn't left his clothes on the floor, but there was no trace of anything he'd worn the night before. Mara must have started the laundry. His face in the bathroom mirror showed no evidence of sex slick, though when he put his fingers to his nose, the scent was undeniable. God damn it, he muttered, and turned on the hot water tap. Only cold came up from the well. 
He took a wash rag from the shower, ran it through the icy water and over a dried out cake of Irish spring, and scrubbed his face and neck. He was surprised at the amount of dirt that came off on the cloth. If he weren't convinced it would make him vomit, he would have run it over his tongue and teeth. He would have eaten the soap and drank every bit of water in the well if it would wash Ralph Levin's from his mind. Thank you.